All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Sunday morning worship service as we just gather together and remember the goodness of our Lord and to celebrate the goodness of our Lord to, uh, you know, you really think we come together and we, we celebrate the, just the simple fact that he died for us, that he redeemed us to himself. And when you, when you put that in place, uh, you know, we were just in, in Sunday school for senior high talking about how God has blessed us with all heavenly blessings. And, and that really covers it all, doesn't it? Once he, once he gave his son to die for us, there was no heavenly blessing withheld from us anymore. And today we can come and worship him for that. So Lord, we are so grateful. We, we do worship you and honor you and praise you for all the great things you've done for us. Lord, and, and we might have some difficult situations going on, Lord. We might have things weighing heavily on our heart. But that still will not change that you have given us every heavenly blessing, Lord. And that we can look forward to an eternity with no pain, no sorrow, no sickness, no death, no sin, and no struggling with the flesh anymore, Lord. And that is a truly exciting prospect. So, Lord, we praise you today. And, uh, Lord, as we just lift our voices up to you, may you find it pleasing. Amen. Well, good morning. Our hymn this morning is 364. 364, my Jesus, I love thee. Why don't you stand if you're able and sing with me all four verses. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the folly of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon. seated. Can you believe it? Once again, another package. This is, you guys are getting out of hand here, I'll tell you. <laughs> Deacon Gregory Schmitter. 
Jesus, I wonder if that's prophetic. I, I think so. Born on February 6th, 8.31 a.m., I believe. Eight pounds, seven ounces, 20 and a half inches. Make sure you get that half in there. We're going to welcome you, buddy, and you can cry all you want. We're still going to sing. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come to me. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come to me. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come, the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them, do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And do not forbid them, do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Let the little children come, let the little children come, let the little children come to me. Let the little children come. Let the little children come. Let the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And do not forbid them. Do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Welcome aboard, Deacon. What a great name, huh? That guy I think is Deacon Jones, you know? <laughs> That's it. Well, ah, all right. Well, there's no really good announcements after that one, right? But, um,. I guess we'll segue saying about 12 years from now, Deacon will par be participating in his first famine, which is this weekend, by the way, for those of you who don't know, if kids have come up and asked you to support them, we'll be doing the 30-hour famine and supporting our local pregnancy care centers um, and splitting the, the funds between Geneva and Newark's care centers this year. Um, just a, a great opportunity for the kids. Uh, if you have any kid in your family that would like to come between the ages, well, we'll say grades of 7th and 12th grade, they're welcome. You just need to see me to get a packet. Um, we will be using school rules for the COVID safety for people who might have some concerns. Um, and just, it's going to be a great time this year. We're really excited about what the Lord is going to do. We have times of worship, times of teaching, times of fellowship, some games, and we do service projects as well so it's a very packed in 24 hour period with the kids um so we really really enjoy it and would uh if nothing else covet your prayers for for what goes on this weekend and that the lord would be speaking to everyone's heart who's involved all right also going on you'll notice in the bulletin uh, the gals bible site is going to be starting back up on march 13th You'll see also on April 3rd, we're having another food giveaway. Uh, you can see um, Carol about that if you have any questions, or John Adler. Um, there will also be a meeting this coming Sunday, so a week from today, after for anyone interested in helping and what they can do to get involved. Um, again, more questions, you can see Carol Nardozzi or John Adler. Any other announcements? Anything we're missing? All right. Oh, yes, and we're taking donations. Yep, yep, typical stuff like last time. Yep, yep, 
There can be monetary donations if you don't have time to get out and shop. And again, non-perishables, please. Thank you. All right, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. Our reading today will be verses 18 through 24. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at, the, at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. And Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourselves according to your families, and kill the Passover lamb. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses and strike you. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. Oh Lord, what an amazing precursor you, and just a foreshadowing of the cross, Lord. By your blood, the destroyer passes over us, Lord. And we thank you again because you have been so faithful to us and so good to us, Lord. And as we prepare our hearts to worship you, not only through song, but also through the giving of tithes and offerings, Lord, we want to return to you the little, just the, a little of what you've given us so graciously. May it be used for your glory. May it be used to bring lost souls into your kingdom, Lord. And may we give our lives for that purpose, our efforts and our time. In Jesus' name, amen. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Sin. I want to let my dear Savior in, and Jesus came like a stranger in the Just a few more weary days and then I 
darkness no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow. Showing us that light, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to um, have something to look forward to, that blessed hope, Lord, that you've given us. Father, uh, let us not just stop at seeing the light, Lord, but let us long for more of it. Let us hunger after you, Father, after your righteousness. As you tell us, uh, if we hunger and thirst for you, Lord, we will be filled. And so we ask for that filling this morning. And we give you this time in your name. Yeah. 
want to touch you. We lift our voices higher and higher and higher to you. One more time. We lift our holy hands up. We want to touch you. We lift our voices higher and higher and higher to you. Yeah. 
to be praised, God. And unfortunately, all we have is, is not sufficient, Lord, to praise you for what, what you deserve. But Lord, God, we pray that, uh, that it would be pleasing to you nonetheless, Father, that our hearts would be in the right place. As we prepare to open your word, Lord, and hear from you that we would surrender our hearts, surrender the areas that we're keeping from you, Lord, the areas that need to be conformed by you, by your spirit. We give that over to you, Lord. We 
we again, we ask for a deeper hunger, a deeper thirst for your righteousness, Lord, for you, that we might leave this place different than we came in, and that the world around us would see that, Lord, that the light would shine bright, that they would see it, and just wonder why we're different, Father, that you might be glorified ultimately. So we give you this time, and give you our hearts ultimately, Lord, in your name, amen. Amen. And the children may be dismissed. That means half the sanctuary. <laughs> there they go. The next generation, the army of God is walking out. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that exciting? To know that God is in control. He's on the throne, isn't he? And it's a good thing. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope you do, if you don't, there are Bibles in the chair in front of you. Just look down below. We want to make sure that everybody has a Bible. And you may open to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. Matthew 26. Well, what is Easter is the 4th of April, right? So, kind of a little on the early side. So that means we have this Sunday, 4 in March, and we're already at Easter. So I need your prayers, because we're going to try to do the Passion, those two chapters that come after the Olivet Discourse, chapters 26 and 27, that speak of a period of time less than 24 hours when um, Jesus experiences the passion. Um, in Mark's gospel, which is parallel to Matthew, we have it in chapters 14 and 15. And in Luke's gospel, we have it in chapters 22 and 23. And then, of course, the last chapter in each of those is um, the Resurrection. Resurrection Sunday. Coming soon. Sooner than we ever think. Every time we get to Christmas, I say, don't blink because it'll be Easter. And boy, sure enough, it does do that every time. Now, the interesting thing is that in John's Gospel, you have chapters 13 through 17. What was that? Five? Six chapters? Five? Um, that speak of this same time frame. Less than a 24-hour period. And of course, in that gospel, we have what is called, quite often, the upper room discourse, where Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. It begins with, as he washes their feet, it's the night he was betrayed. It's that night that Passover begins. And so as we read these things, you want to be uh, thinking about the connections and the fact that you need all four Gospels to really get the full picture of what really took place during that time when Jesus was arrested, scourged, crucified, uh, and buried. Um, very important that the scriptures, that is, the Old Testament scriptures, speak of all these things. And as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he gives the gospel in verses 3 and 4, he said, these things have to be according to the scriptures, that he died. It's essential that he died because that's what paid that blood is the sacrifice, the paschal lamb, the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And so we need to make sure that we are checking out all the gospels to coordinate everything that happened. Otherwise, you miss pieces of it. 
If you're in chapter 26, I'm going to read verses 1 through 25. And then we're going to uh, talk about how these events unfold. Verse 1 in chapter 26 of Matthew. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, that is the Olivet Discourse, chapters 24 and 25, which we just finished in Matthew's Gospel, that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. We'll come back to that thought, because remember, the Messiah, the Lamb slain from the foundation, had to be crucified on the Passover. Because if he wasn't, then all of the scripture in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53 and all those places that we look at, they would not have been true and would not have been fulfilled accurately. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. That's a very telling verse. We'll talk about that particularly. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the entire world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give to me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, or verily, verily, or truly, I tell you, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say, Is it Judas? <laughs> they didn't say that. I find that fascinating. Is it the guy with the black cape and the mask? I mean, the guy that's doing all... No, they didn't have a clue. And Jesus never revealed it. He allowed Judas to do that part which was going to take place. But each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? <laughs> is it you? It's all of us. We're the one that crucified the Lord. It's my sin. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer, isn't it? Is it I, Lord? He answered them, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. And we get a lot more of that in John 13. 
the Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. A woe is never good. It's worse than a low. <laughs> a low is behold. A woe is woe. You don't want God saying woe to you. I guess unless you're a horse. And he says, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. Then Jesus, who was betraying him, answered and said, I'm sorry, Judas, not Jesus, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. What a sobering thought. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, as we look into your eyes, as we gaze into the one who paid it all, we ask for discernment. We ask you for a fresh filling right this moment in each of our hearts of your Holy Spirit to give us understanding, to guide us through your word, which is powerful, your word which is sharper than a two-edged sword. And Lord, if there's any surgery that needs to be done in my heart, in our hearts, then we give you permission to not only give us the understanding, but to cut away everything and anything in our lives that is not of you. We need you to light by your Holy Spirit, illuminate your word, that we might gain understanding. And we pray this in Jesus' name. You know, because all power in heaven and earth have been placed in the hands of Jesus, he was, in a sense, directing his own death. He was in command throughout all of this amazing series of events. It tells us in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus says this, Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. That's kind of King james -y there. I, I like that part. Of my own accord. I have power. Listen to what Jesus says. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. My Father has commanded me in this manner. What a remarkable thing because on the surface and to the crowds, to the multitudes, they would have looked and said, oh my goodness, what's going on here? They're crucifying Jesus. Many of the multitude said, crucify him, crucify him. But there were many there that were going, what is going on? And had they been paying careful attention to what Jesus said, he said very clearly in John's gospel in chapter 10 when he was teaching, he says, I have the power to lay my life down and I take it up again. Jesus is clearly in control. He's just finished giving them the Olivet Discourse. He's been answering the disciples' questions. Remember, he wasn't speaking to the multitudes. He was speaking to the disciples, the learners, the believers. He's been answering the disciples' questions regarding the signs of his coming and the sign of the end of the age, and he has been warning them to be watching for his appearing and to be prepared, watching how they are living. Man, we are in perilous times. I know that I need to be watching 
how I am living. For the most part, all of that Olivet Discourse was very Jewish. Judgment, that last judgment in chapter 25, for how the people and all of the nations of the world have treated the Jews during the tribulation, the seven years of tribulation, Jacob's sorrow or Jacob's trouble. Remember that Matthew, in his gospel, is giving us a picture of the lion of the tribe of Judah, a gospel that's principally written to the Jew. In fact, there is more Old Testament quoting by Jesus and in Matthew's gospel than all the other gospels combined because he was, that was the, the bent of his gospel. Matthew, who was a Levite and a tax collector, he understood and knew the Jewish people best of all of the writers, and he was, God wanted to make sure that the Jews understood. But Matthew's giving a picture of the line of the tribe of Judah. Um, at this point in the narrative, we see Jesus in charge of the whole flow of events. This is the king. He's the victor. Remember, we don't fight for victory as Christians. We fight from victory. We already have the victory. The battle is the Lord, but ours is the victory. Wow. He's the victor in all these things, and now he's orchestrating everything. Mark's gospel, on the other hand, is written primarily to the Romans, and he follows virtually the same sequence in these events we're going to look at today as Matthew does. Luke writes mostly, specifically, to the Gentiles. Because Luke was a Gentile. He was a doctor, but he was a Gentile. And with the exception of a few things that are only found in Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel is interesting because Luke's gospel, there's things that we find in this account that you don't find in the other three Gospels. He as well follows the sequence, though, pretty closely. But John's Gospel is very unique because John's Gospel is written to the church. And that's why you'll find when you read John's Gospel all kinds of explanation of the Jewish feasts and the Jewish traditions because John is well aware, and by the way, his gospel was written significantly later than the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he's trying to give insights to the church about the Jewishness of the gospel in its inception. It's quite easy in the church today, if you're not careful, if you're not reading your Bible carefully, to miss that point that most of the Christians in the beginning of the church were all Jewish. Almost all of them. Some scholars believe up to 50, even 100,000 people before a Gentile ever got saved. Remember, it wasn't until Philip went to Samaria and the Ethiopian eunuch, it wasn't until chapter 10 in the book of Acts that Cornelius, the centurion, the Roman centurion, got saved, and then his household member. So now we have this narrative. Excuse me, I ate some peanut butter so I wouldn't faint. <laughs> About three minutes ago. Okay. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Now we get a little more information in Luke's gospel. I'll just read it to you because in Luke's gospel, it says this. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Remember when John the Baptist 
was beheaded by Herod Antipas. And remember, when Jesus was doing all his miracles, Herod got nervous. He says, I think John came back from the dead, remember? See, there was always this tension with the leadership of the church and the Jews' leadership and the Romans. And this is part of what's going on in this scenario. The time of the Passover was a, was a very crazy time because the Romans were trying to quell the zealots and all the rebelliousness because, listen, the Jews weren't looking for a Messiah that was going to die. <laughs> a Messiah that was going to get rid of their sin. They were looking to sit under their own vine and their own fig tree because that's what they read in the parts of the Old Testament that described what would happen in a millennial kingdom. But they didn't and were not able to see that, yes, the lion of the tribe of Judah will come, but the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth had to pay the penalty for their sin. And boy, that's very clear in Matthew chapter 1 when we read the account of the angel visiting Mary, saying, and he will forgive the sins of his people. It's so easy to get caught up in all the excitement of Christianity and some of the things that we do and forget why he really came. He came because I'm the one that put him on the cross. I'm the one responsible for his death. But yet without his death, there'd be no hope. There'd be no life. There'd be no heaven. There'd be no future for us. And we would have to fear death. But Jesus Christ, it tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, Paul writes to Timothy, he abolished death. Can anyone say hallelujah? He abolished death? Well, yes, of course. He said to Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection. You're looking at him. The resurrection's a person, Martha. It's not some doctrine that you believe in at church. I'm the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. Thank God he was both. Amen? Because then he could represent you and me. Then the chief priests, verse 3, I think, I've got so many notes I've obliterated it. Then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. Now remember who Caiaphas is. Caiaphas, kind of a joint high priest with Annas. And Annas was his father-in-law. And he was the one that ran the bazaar. That is, all the craziness that went on in the temple that Jesus was so upset about when he cleared them out with the, with the, um, the whip and said, you've made my house a den of thieves when it's supposed to be a house of prayer, ripping the people off so that when pilgrims would come from far away, they would not experience what they came to experience. The love and the understanding of who God really was, to be able to really worship them. And the people's choice was Annas. He was the Jewish high priest, according to the Jews. But this Caiaphas was a Roman appointee. So there's a lot of tension going on that you don't really understand unless you see and understand the history. And Caiaphas, he was co-regent with this Annas from 18 to about 36 A.D. So he was there until about three and a half years after Jesus died on the cross. It starts to shed a little more light and some understanding when you read some of these passages that there's a lot more to this than what you see just on, on, uh, in the verses here. And plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. That word trickery would be better translated deception. In the Greek, 
and I love this, especially in the day that we're living in, we can relate to this. It means evil craft. Is there any evil craftiness going on in the world today? Evil craft. That's an amazing truth. He plotted to take Jesus. They plotted to take Jesus by evil craft and kill him. Well, we know what happened right after Lazarus in chapter 11 of John's gospel was raised from the dead. What happened? Someone went and squealed on Jesus and said to the religious leaders, now look what he's doing. He's raising the dead. And they went, well, we can't have that. What a terrible thing to bring someone back to life. We just can't have that. That would be like medicine that worked. How would we make our money? See, nothing's new under the sun. You know, we've had a rough year, right, with the COVID thing. But, you know, I was reading The Voice of the Martyrs. They had a rougher year. I was reading about Wes Bentley in far-reaching ministry. And I'm reading about these young chaplains who have families, by the way, who are being slaughtered in the Sudan. Oh, man, I can't believe i got to wear a mask. I could be being tortured. <laughs> or sent to prison. And we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, uh, the way things are going, we don't know what the future holds, except for it holds heaven for you and me. Because we have hope. By the way, we don't just have hope. We have grace. We are saved by grace through faith. That was mighty nice of God to give grace to me. Because I didn't deserve it. I'm a sinner. And when we look at these things, we need to make this personal, I think. They said this. They plotted to take him by evil craft, but they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar. Here again, because of the fear of the people. But remember, the Bible teaches, the scriptures, the prophecies say, he had to die on the feast day. He had to die on Passover. It wasn't until later, when you read in Exodus, that the Passover included the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You started with the Passover, the day that Jesus died, and then you had seven days of unleavened bread. They even made a game out of it. Had the little kids find all the leaven, and they would gather any scrap of yeast, leaven, that which makes the dough rise. But in the scriptures, the leaven, the yeast, speaks of and is always a type of our sin. Yes, it raises the dough so you can have a nice loaf of fluffy bread. But the fact of the matter is that in the scriptures, it always speaks of sin, of leaven. And so they're saying not during the feast, it's like when Jesus was hanging on the cross, what did they say? Come down and show us you're the Messiah. Well, you idiot. Now, I'm talking about these are the religious leaders that are supposed to be telling the people about God. And in their own scriptures, it says what? It says he died on the Sabbath. He has to die on that day because that's when the lambs died in Exodus chapter 12, they died on Passover. That was the beginning of Passover. That was everything that was going to be pointing to our Passover or Paschal Lamb, Jesus Christ. When you start seeing how Old Testament scriptures weave a pattern, a picture, a beauty to show us why the New Testament says what it says, it gets pretty exciting because we have incredible evidence of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah that would come and deliver his people Israel, and then we would get grafted in as Gentiles. Again, mighty nice of him to allow us to be grafted in 
unnatural branches, Gentiles who had no hope, Gentiles who had nothing, nothing but the witness of those that would share who the Messiah is. Uh, just remarkable stuff. And so it says, lest there be an uproar among the people, they were worried about a riot. They weren't worried about whether the people got to know God. In fact, they were ripping them off. Now, there's a little, it's interesting how this works because this seems to be the time that this happened. It, it's in the same order in Matthew, uh, Mark's gospel. It's in a little bit of the same order in Luke's gospel. And it, it it's, um, gives us a lot of extra information in John's Gospel. Let me read from John's Gospel to you. No, I'm sorry, Luke's Gospel. It says this. In Luke 22, it says, Then Satan entered Judas, named Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve, and he went his way. Now, we'll get to that in a minute when we get down further in the narrative. But you see, it's told to us in John's gospel and in Luke's gospel that Satan entered into Judas. Wow. That, that, that's pretty scary stuff. He entered. He didn't just, you know, worship Satan. He actually entered into him because he was the one that was going to betray the Lord. Now, there's this anointing at Bethany. Okay, we're not going to do much on this because we did a study on this when we were in John's Gospel. When Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant saying, why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. By the way, John in his gospel tells us the one that said that was Judas because he was holding the money and he would help himself to the money bag. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. Karl Marx should have read that. And for in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. What a remarkable insight that Mary had because the other guys were clueless right up to when they had in Luke's gospel, they were, Jesus was talking about the body being his, the bread being his body and the, 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 the wine being his blood. And they're like, who's the greatest? They're still arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus is about to go to his death on the cross. They didn't have a clue. But Mary, it says that whenever the gospel is given, this story will be told. Because Mary realized and Mary took what some scholars believe could have been worth an entire year's wages. Could have been something that she would use for her dowry, for waiting for her wedding. And she poured that out. Understanding. Better than the apostles, better than the disciples. Understanding that he was going to die. And so she anointed him ahead of time. That's why Martha never had to go to the tomb. She had already taken care of business. They were going to anoint the body. Martha goes, I anointed him last week, knowing this was going to happen. Pretty amazing. Now, you see, the issue for you and me here is really the sacrifice. The costly sacrifice that Martha made. And whenever we worship the Lord in spirit and truth, it's a sacrifice. You know, we sing the song. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord. And when we sacrifice, it costs something. And see, 
the sacrifice is this fragrant, expensive oil, the spikenard. And she'd break the neck and then pour it out upon Jesus. And of course, it wasn't just Judas. They all said, well, this is a waste. We could have fed all the poor. <laughs> and of course, Jesus says, yeah, you're always going to have the poor, but you're not always going to have me. I'm going back to my father. And she did it for my burial, and it will never be forgotten. And you see, this fragrance is what you and I have. It, it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Now thanks be to God who always leads us, that is Christians, in triumph in Christ and through us, you and me, diffuses or makes known the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Are you making known the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere you go? Well, you are. <laughs> whether you know it or not, and whether you do it or not, there's a fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. By the way, that phrase speaks of the sweet savor of the Old Testament sacrifices that would go up to the nostrils of God and it would satisfy him and please him. A sweet-smelling aroma. Among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. There's only two categories of people on the entire planet. You're either being saved or you're perishing. You're either born again or you're going to the lake of fire. You know, we don't like to talk about that. We might frighten people. Yeah, so let's not tell them and let them go to hell. <laughs> no. We're a fragrance everywhere we go. To the one were the aroma of death leading to death, those that are perishing. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. I like what Paul ends that little paragraph with. He says, and who is sufficient for these things? See, you might be saying, well, I could never go out and be fragranced like that. I, I, I get embarrassed when I'm, I don't, what if they get upset with me? What if they spit on me? You know, what if something happens? And it says there, Paul says, and who is sufficient for these things? But I can do what? All things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You're right. I can't do it either. I'm just like you. I go to Walmart and God says, tell that person about me. Well, Lord, well you know, I, I, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm getting supper. My wife expects me back now. Or anything else. I'm afraid. And I do, I get afraid, don't you? I get afraid. But, but God gives me the strength. Because I can do all things through Christ. And one of the things we should always do is do what he tells us to do. Because I've had it happen where I didn't do it. And later I had to go, you know, Lord, you, that was you, wasn't it? And, and you know what's great about Jesus? He doesn't go, you think? <laughs> no, no. He says, yeah, that was me, Ray. But let it rest on the bosom of Jesus. And we, let, let's just keep going forward. I got enough grace for you to keep going forward. And so there's this beautiful picture, and then you go back to the text, and it says in verse 14, now we're back to Judas' betrayal, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Now, I'll tell you what's fascinating, because in the Old Testament, we have the verse. The reason we know, the way we know that that is a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled is because of Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Listen to them. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, 
and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. How about that? Written 600 years before Jesus was born and before Judas was born. And the Lord said to me, throw it into the potter, that princely price. No doubt the Holy Spirit through Zechariah being sarcastic. That's what I'm worth to you? The Son of God, the creator of heaven and earth, I'm worth to you 30 pieces. You'll sell your soul for 30 pieces of silver? A lot of people will. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set upon me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. By the way, what happened? They took the money and they said, we can't use this money. It's blood money. They knew that what they had done was wrong. We threw it into the potter's field, the place where there was no value in that land because all it was was shards of pottery that had been discarded and nothing could grow there. So all they could do is just throw it in to the potter's field because they knew it was blood money. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That they were that evil. They knew exactly what they were doing, but I'm going to do it anyway. Wow. That's wicked craft, <laughs> evil craft. But you see, the Scripture bears it out. What are you willing to give me? They counted out 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, from that time, they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. From that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Hey, that was going on right from the time that Lazarus got raised from the dead. They said, now he's raising people. And it says, they plotted to kill him. They plotted to kill him. And you see, in Luke's gospel, we get the rest of the story. It says in Luke 22, uh, verse 3, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. And listen to this. So he, that is Judas, went his way. Which way are you going? Am I going my way or do I go God's way? Isn't that a choice we make every day? Maybe sometimes moment by moment. And it says that Judas went his way. And his way was the way of covetousness, greed. By the way, Jude, the half-brother of of Jesus, who wrote the epistle of Jude, he says, it's the way of Balaam. Greedy. Greedy for filthy lucre. Greedy for, you know, being covetous. Wanting something that doesn't belong to you. And this is very important because we need to see that he went his way and we need to go another way. We need to go God's way. Um, I, this has always been uh, an amazing verse to me in Scripture. It's in Psalm 103, and we don't typically look at this verse. Usually Psalm 103, we bless the Lord, O my soul, and bless the Lord, uh, all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Forget not His benefits. We love that part, and we love the part about how He forgives us for, as far as the uh, he forgives my sins as far as the east is from the west. But we don't often think about this verse. He, that is God, made known his ways, God's ways, to Moses. Listen to this. His acts, the things that God did to the children of Israel. Wow. What does that mean? The children of Israel saw all the acts. They saw the plagues. They witnessed 
the water at Marah becoming sweet again after it was bitter. They saw the water and drank the water that came miraculously out of the rock. They knew all the things that God was doing. They didn't know his ways. Moses in Exodus 34, 6 and 7 says, Lord, I, now I want to know you. Just like Paul said in Philippians 3.10. And he says, I want to know your ways. He goes, well, you know, Mo, if you ever saw me, you'd faint dead away. You, you disintegrate. But I'll show you the back part of me. And that's when he revealed, I'm the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, abounding in love and all that. So the question is, am I going to be like Judas and go my own way? See, he went his way. His way was he was the son of perdition. And he ended up betraying. Now, by the way, before we get too down on Judas, I've betrayed the Lord too. In fact, it says in the Old Testament, scatter, uh, strike the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered in Zechariah chapter 13. They all ran. The only one that didn't run was John. He went into the house of the high priest because he knew the family. But all the rest ran. All the rest betrayed. Listen, we read about Peter's denial a little bit later in our in narrative, and the fact is, they all denied him. It wasn't just Peter. They all denied him. But they also all died a martyr's death, a horrible. And if you read Fox's book of Martyr, they give you the details. Pretty gruesome. They all went to their death because why? They all believed. They really did believe. And so when we go back to our text now, now he goes and it talks about celebration of the Passover. And this is the meat now of what's going on. Let's read it. Verse 17. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. I want to point something out here to you in verses 17 and 18. This is a prophecy. Let, let me tell you how amazing this prophecy is. In Mark's gospel, do I want Mark or do I want, let me just find this. Yeah, in Mark's gospel, it says that it was on the, first day, uh, on the first day of unleavened bread, the Passover. It says, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. You carried a pitcher of water on your head in those days, and men didn't do that. Women were the ones that carried the water. Sorry, I didn't write it. Okay, and but the women were the ones that did that. So already this is a little unusual. A man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Listen, I'm proud of the disciples that they didn't go, a guy? Lord, what are you, what are you talking about? Women carry the water. No, they didn't say that. Then he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. There make it ready for me. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it. Listen to this. They found it just as he had said to them. Now, the reason I point that out is we tend to think of prophecy only as like Isaiah 53, 600 years before Jesus, and then it happens, you know, 2,600 years later or 600 years later. No. Sometimes the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there's prophecy that happens immediately. This one happened right away. They said, listen, just go. Now, I've got an imagination. Forgive me. You know, I mean, what in the world is going on here? Did Jesus meet with the guy beforehand? It doesn't say. I'd like to think, with my God who can do all things, nothing's too difficult for him, that somehow he could communicate it to that guy and he got it ready and didn't even know why he was getting it ready until the disciples came. Oh, that's what that voice was. Who knows, right? I'm, again, not thus saith the Lord, but that's clearly a possibility when given the rest of Scripture. And this kind of fascinates me and really kind of excites me. Because guess what? The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same what? 
yesterday, today, and forever. I love that word forever. How long are we going to heaven? Forever. And we're taking all our babies with us, aren't we? Amen? And hopefully we're taking all our spouses and all of our kids and we're taking all of our, our parents, you know. <laughs> well, some of us, it's too late for that. But what I'm saying is that's his desire because the Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, he says in verse 19, So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now, as they were eating, he said, Verily, verily, truly, surely, assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And then they were exceedingly sorrowful. I would have been too. And each of them began to say, Lord, is it me? Am I, you know, why, why is this so important? Because they were measuring their own hearts. They were considering, I know what I'm like. And that's the kind of guy I could be to betray my own master. It'd be, you know, you ever wonder, you know, I just talked about some of this the other day. Pastor Mark, remember Pastor Mark was one of my assistant pastors back when, and now he's in Geneva. And we had this Wednesday morning prayer group that's still meeting today almost 20 years later and we would have that and he came to us one time and he goes you think you're a sinner you don't think you're a sinner you don't think your heart is wicked and evil he says how about we take every thought you just had for the last 24 hours not even a week just the last 24 hours and we somehow could get it into the sanctuary onto the screen all your thoughts for the last 24 hours how many volunteers do we have none You'd be standing at the back door with an AK-47. You ain't coming in here. Why? Because the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. And you and I both know that. And even people that aren't saved really know it if they stop and think about it. And that's why we need a Savior. That's why we need to be healed. That's why we need to be born of God's Spirit in order to walk in the light and live in the Spirit. Is it me, Lord? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. And by the way, you get the whole commentary on that in John 13, don't you? John 13, we read all about it. And, and he tells them, it's the one who dips his hand in the dish with me. Let me just read from John 8, uh, 13, 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eats, did you hear that? that the scripture might be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. You know where that is? Psalm 49.1. Or is it 41.9? Sorry. 41.9. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That's a psalm of David. He's talking in that time about Ahithophel. No doubt who had betrayed him. But it's also a prophecy of what would happen over, over a thousand years later on Calvary. And when you begin to see these things, and then it says in um, uh, Psalm 55, It says this, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it, nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. Everywhere Jesus went with the disciples, Judas was with him. My companion, listen to this, we took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of of God in the throng. And in John 13, when Judas betrayed Jesus, he said, now is my soul troubled. And he says, I lost my text, sorry. The Son of Man indeed goes just as is written of him. And woe to that man by whom 
The Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, look at this carefully. Answered him and said, Rabbi, teacher, is it I? And he says, you have said it. Just like when Pilate, he says, then you're a king, Pilate said. So then there you're, for you're a king. And remember what he said? He said, you said it, buddy. And is that something you thought of on your own? Or did you hear someone else saying it? Because if you don't think of it on your own, you can't have any part with me. Because if you're not on the side of truth, you can't hear my voice. No one, who, no one who's on the side of truth, everyone on the side of truth, hears my voice. Meaning, Pilate, since you don't hear my voice, you're not on the side of truth. And look, note this, please. We'll end right here. Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. I want you to take note of the fact that in the scriptures, Judas never addressed Jesus as Lord. He only said, Rabbi. Why? Because he never was his Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think it's verse 3, it says, nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. And I don't mean someone just going, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, like a parrot. No, no, that in their heart. And so as we look at this, we get ready for what perfect timing. Don't we have communion next week, right? The Lord institutes the Lord's Supper. And then we'll look at Peter's denial, and then hopefully we'll look at the Garden of Gethsemane. Here's my goal. Keep praying for me that we can get through these two chapters by the time we get to Easter, and then each last chapter of each gospel talks about what? The resurrection. Well, except for John, because you have John 21 after the resurrection. So we'll look at that next time, and we'll deal with the, uh, our communion, but at the same time, we'll look at the Passover back in Exodus 12, which I wanted to do today, but it didn't have time and won't fit in. So this is what we need to do as we celebrate this time frame, this Lenten period, these 40 days prior to uh, Good Friday and, and uh, Resurrection Sunday, we call it here. Um, we need to examine these things and really understand what happened in that 24-hour period. That'll be our goal. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this day and the worship that you allowed us to participate in. Uh, we bring praises, sacrifices of praises to you, Lord. And we want to make sure that we understand that sometimes the sacrifices are very costly. And yet, it's a fragrance. It's a sweet aroma that goes up to your nostrils, Lord. And it's a witness making known, making known the God, Jehovah, who sent his Son that everyone that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life.
Father, that is our prayer this morning, Lord, that you would um, humble us, that you would uh, allow us to see your face more clearly, Lord, that we might go proclaim your truth to the world, Lord, that they would see our light. So take us out of this place, Lord. Um, allow us to be filled with your spirit, to be encouraged by the saints, Lord, of the gathering, and uh, by the fellowship that we were able to have today, and uh, take us out to be lights that you've called us to be. We ask this in your name. Amen.